I'm staying away with intention from languages like love and consciousness. So the word consciousness and love are so overused and they've literally ceased meaning anything. They're used in a thousand different ways by a thousand different people and they simply don't mean anything anymore. So I've stayed away and tried to both deepen thought and also create a new field of language, right? So for example, a field of value, right? Is that the way we want to talk about it? That's interesting. We talk about eros, not love for lots of good reasons, right? In other words, so we've tried to do is actually lay down both new structures, evolving structures of thought, but also a new field of language. many paths is radically committed to telling the new universe story. Now for my recap from last week, the evolution of the student teacher relationship. In response to the meta crisis and the existential risk faced by humanity, we have to evolve the source code of consciousness and culture to tell a new story of value, which both integrates the best of the past and is a radically new evolutionary emergent. This calls for a teacher student relationship, which is grounded in the field of value and honors both the transmission of the teacher and honors the unique self of the student. This relationship is not a sharing of information, but is a great act of cosmic eros performed in the space of mind and heart. In this teacher-student relationship, the teacher penetrates and the student receives as it should be. And the student receives so deeply that the very force of their receiving penetrates the teacher and allows the transmission to evolve. This type of relationship is not for everyone. It is in post-conventional rather than conventional, radically different from both the university style transmission of information where the assumption is that there's no field of value and from the classical Eastern guru adept relationship in which the teacher's higher attainment of true self gives them authority over the student without honoring or even recognizing their uniqueness. In the cosmoerotic teacher-student relationship, the teacher embodies the field of value, the intrinsic, inherent, not socially constructed telos of reality. The teacher has a genuine attainment in the field of value, even as they are imperfect, flawed, subject to making mistakes, and the teacher can also receive feedback. You feel the teacher standing in the forever field. You know they are willing to die for truth, for goodness, for beauty. The teacher is not making up their own take on reality. The teacher is actually receiving in the field of Eros, in the field of she, in the field of the intimate universe, and then trying to discern distinctions in that field and then penetrating the student with those distinctions. 
the teachers fully active and the teacher and the students fully receiving. And it can switch. It switches because in the nature of the students receiving, they actually penetrate the teacher. This There is this dramatic penetration and that loves the teacher open and the teacher opens into the wider field in an entirely different way. The teacher-student place is this place in which we are this field of value together. It's so beautiful. We are all equal in the field and we all have different roles to play in the field. A student goes all the way with the teacher, not to give them authority over in place where it's inappropriate, but to be impacted. We should be impacted. We are not just autonomy. We are also intimate communion. We're in the field of value and looking at a shared horizon together and we listen to each other. The teacher is in radical devotion to the student and the teacher and the student are both in radical devotion to each other and in devotion together to the field of value. There is transmission and there is penetration and there is mutual penetration and the teacher and student and student and teacher love each other open. It's this very, very, very deep and subtle play. There is enormous possibility open in the teacher-student relationship. Now I invite us to more deeply enter into the holy and sacred spaces of one mountain, many paths, and I turn my word to you, Dr. Mark Goff. I, I want to share with you a little bit. That was such a beautiful Dharma recapitulation and such a beautiful opening by Krista. And we have this hugely important and exciting code that I want to stay very close to this week. But before then, if possible, I just want to do a show of hands, if we can, before we just kind of dive in. How many people are new? I'm just going to take a look at the chat box. How many people have never been here before? Okay, hold on. Let me just take a look at the chat box. Hold on. Because it seems like to me that this is a kind of home crowd week. I, I was hoping, actually, that this was a little bit of a kind of inner family moment and that I could maybe spend a few minutes if everyone's up for it. Let me just find each other. If you've got a yes on this in the chat box. And I want to just talk a little bit deeply, kind of what are we doing here? Right? And, the, and as, yes, we're at this place between utopia and dystopia, and we're, we're articulating this new source code of value in response to the meta crisis. That's a deep bunch of sentences. But I want to actually go in a little bit deeper, if that's okay. And just maybe do something that we never get to do, just in a really deep kind of home, intimate place, and, and share a little bit about just the structure of how this all works. As Christina Amelon so beautifully just unpacks the different offerings, we kind of say, how does this all fit together? Okay, so who's a yes on that, if that's helpful? I'm going to just kind of feel this with y'all, okay? So... I'm going to give you an example. I'm going to start in the middle. Okay. So we do one mountain. What week of this is one mountain? Anybody? What, what week is one mountain? What week are we up to? We're, we're close to 400 someplace. What week? Anybody? 387. Okay. So we're in the 387, week 387 of one mountain. So I'm just going to give you one example. So a couple of days ago, I got a text and the text was from, you know, Elena. And I'm also, by the way, just realizing that lots of people don't realize that it's daylight savings time. So lots of people are going to come at the wrong time this week. I also realize that as well. But putting that aside, so I'm just, I got a text from Elena, um, you know, a couple of days ago. And Elena does a very beautiful thing. She's an artist kind of philosopher and a, and a, and a very, very good, you know, crafter of artistic crafter of words. And so we've developed together a way of taking one mountain and kind of laying it out poetically on a piece of paper, right? And we did a couple of years with a wonderful, wonderful person. And we tried one way of doing, it was a great, beautiful experiment, which was led by a friend of ours 
named Joycey, who I very much look forward, Christina Almond, that you and I will meet with soon. And she'll really step in with her incredible gifts, right, to the team. So we did that as a very, very deep dive experiment. It was a great experiment. And then we decided, based on what we learned from that experiment, we decided that we were going to kind of lay out one mountain in a different way. We we're going to lay it out almost poetically so that you could actually feel like you were here. And we wouldn't try and translate it into paragraph sentences, right? But we would actually try and lay it out as a teaching. Now go slow. So, so one of the reasons we do one mountain is to actually kind of unfold new chapters, new dimensions of the great new story of value that we need to respond to the meta crisis. And every single week we try and lay out a new dimension of that story, one. Then Elena steps in and kind of, right, it gets, you know, Jacqueline handles whatever needs to be handled. Jacqueline and Jamie are like brilliant and gorgeous and and kind of weaving the strands behind the scenes and doing whatever needs to be done in a thousand different ways. And then goes to Elena, Elena lays it out. And then there's this moment, and I wanna just give you a kind of, um, right? right. I wanna give you just a kind of um, behind the scenes. So Elena writes me and says, here's a summation. I just wrote a summation. And I, I think Elena's here. Is Elena, is that right that you write a summation every week? And I think that's right. So she writes a summation. And so I read the summation. And then when I read the summation, this week is a perfect example. There was a description of the teacher-student relationship. Summary, thank you, excuse me, young lady. A summary, not a summation, right? So there was a description on the teacher-student relationship and how it moves between them, which was an accurate description of what we said last week that got beautifully recapitulated by Christina Amelon this week as she chose her recapitulation. But it was missing, as I read it, I said, I don't know, but it's, it's missing one dimension of how actually that relationship, that teacher-student relationship changes. And there's moments when the student actually becomes the teacher, not just because they're receiving so deeply that it penetrates the teacher, but they're actually teaching something. You know, the teacher actually doesn't know something. There's actually some missing piece. So I added a couple of words, got a couple of sentences, right? Elena immediately got them, integrated them, and put them in the summary. Now, just, just watch for a second. So I just want you to just, just notice what happened. And so I'm gonna put a bunch of pieces together, okay? So we just did a symposium on world religion at the Monastic Academy, which is here in Vermont, in which was a small group of people, 25, 30 people, and we did a deep dive symposium, which was for the purpose of a key future book for the great live around world religion. Stay slow with me. David, who's going to be reading the code a little later, and Christina were there. And we did, Suzette was there. Christina Kincaid was there at that conversation, right? We did a, a deep dive, right, on what? On Benjamin, were you there at that conversation? I think you were, right? But we did a deep dive, particularly, right, David and Christina and I did a deep dive on Topher was there. Topher was there. That's right. Topher was there. Tough words in that conversation, right? Right. We did a deep dive on the nature of the teacher-student relationship, right? Is that right, Christina David? We did a deep dive and it was like a two, three hour deep dive, right? Then there was a moment where David and Christina then stepped in and did a one mountain on teacher-student relationship, right? A couple of weeks ago, All right? Then last week, right? I tried to recapitulate the teacher-student relationship in response to their week, which was in response to, right, our deep dive at the Monastic Academy. Then Elena did this beautiful laying out, this beautiful, really stunning job, just kind of laying it out on paper, right? Then she did this beautiful, not um, summation, but summary, right? Right. And then I read the summary and I realized, oh, summary is perfect, but I missed a really important thing. So I added that to the summary. So that's just, it's just one little moment in which we clarified something, right? Something got clarified. So in other words, in the entire process, it wasn't just about who was here, you know, and several hundred people a week engage One Mountain, 
which means that we've imagine you're running an online course for 387 weeks that a few hundred people a week participate in consistently. Right. 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 So it's right. So it's like, wow. So we've gone 387 weeks, 387 weeks with this inner community. But what we're doing is we're sharpening, clarifying the Dharma. Right. And Elena just wrote, you didn't miss it. Right. Right. You know, you just didn't expand on it. So I dropped it from the summary and I noticed it was dropped from the summary and I put it back in because it's a key piece. But what happens is my point is that in all these exchanges, we're clarifying. We're clarifying. We're about to do the hero today. So we're actually going to clarify what we mean by the hero. So there's a couple of paragraphs in the where is that book? Right. In the first principles, first values book. There's three paragraphs, right, on the hero, but we needed to expand it and deepen it. So I talked about it at our board conclave, and we just began to outline it. I've been talking about it in different ways for about a decade, but now we're going to spend two, three weeks really understanding the hero in a very deep way. And notice Marvel movies are at the center of culture, not for no reason. Dune, which is all over the, the theaters now, it's all about the hero. Who is the hero? And who is the hero is who is your society? But, but put that aside for a second. So the point is, what are we trying to do, right? So we're doing the crossing, right? Which is coming up, which Christine Amelon talked about in Europe. We have mystery school coming up in, you know, several months, right? We have David and Claire are doing in the Unique Self Institute, a whole course offering. There's a regular weekly study that Jamie and, you know, Christina Amelon and David, right? You know, kind of run, you know, an ongoing continuous processes. We do the once a month with with Andrew Sweeney. We're going to be starting in, you know, in September, kind of a once a month course I'm going to give. We have a group holy of holies, right? Why is it set up this way? So it's not set up this way as a as a teaching organization reaching into the world. All right. We really we thought I sat in Terry's house, who's here. I sat at Terry's house a decade ago. Is that true, Terry? I sat at your house at your living room more than a decade ago. It's now 2024, probably in 2013 at Terry's house. And Terry and I went over and Tom Goddard was at a first meeting. And we thought of, should we make the center something like the forum, something like a teaching organization, a kind of transformational teaching organization? And we decided not to for a lot of reasons. But one of them was we thought we, could, we needed to change the source code itself. And to change the source code itself, we need to actually teach and think and feel as a, an interior group, a kind of mystery school, a band of outrageous lovers, where we're going deep into the Dharma and we're formulating the new distinctions. And then all the teaching forums we do are kind of like Dharma laboratories where we clarify the Dharma. We then write the Dharma up in articles and monographs in books. And we don't put out a good book. We put out a great library, which actually distinguishes signal from noise. Because there's this book and that book and that book, and all the books are competing with each other. And it's it's another win-lose metrics of books, right? And, and then none of them actually ultimately impact and they just disappear. And no one's done a great library because it's too hard. It's too complex, right? I I, I every night you know, kind of, and Christina Kincaid can attest to this, I kind of go to sleep and I can't sleep because there are 10, 12, 13 books moving in my head and I'm trying to understand the relationship between them and the relationship between their stages of writing. And I'm trying to figure out how much time God's going to give me on this earth and how, how can we get done this great library? So it's not only written, but it's written, it's artistically edited, it's in the world, it's in play so it can actually penetrate culture and actually change the very source code of who we are. That's a, it's a big deal, right? Right, it's a big deal, okay? Right, it's a big deal. And, and, and we can be, you know, it's, and of course we do spaciousness and, you know, and of course we do our Kava drops, right, Elena? Right, <laughs> but, but, but actually the spaciousness is at the center. Our open spacious heart is at the center. It's not frenetic. I want you to get this, to get the distinction. It's not frenetic. Not a frenetic sense. It's not a, it's actually a very deep center. And out of this deep center, she speaks, and we kind of hear this whirlwind of Dharma that emerges. And we have that sense that they had in Florence, right? In the Renaissance, 
at the Marcello Ficinio Academy, the Florentine Plato Academy, Platonic Academy, where da Vinci was and where just a few hundred people gathered to actually write the new source code, to evolve the new source code. And even that sentence, stay with me closely, okay? Even to say to evolve the new source code, a sentence I've used a thousand times and I and people repeat, that means an enormous amount. It means that there's both a source code and that you can evolve the source code. That's a huge big deal to understand that. That eternity and evolution don't contradict each other. There's a source code of value and you can evolve the source code. So I'll just give you one, 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 one example. I'll just get one dumb example, okay? Just to get this. So watch the movie Dune. The entire movie Dune is a movie in which there's no source code. And so you kind of have psychedelics and politics coming together in this very dramatic way in the Dune universe, right? This huge movie, everyone's watching it now. You've got this heroic figure, right? This beautiful heroic figure. Now the heroic figure comes from the house of Atreides and Atreides are the good guys, but the house of Atreides has not explicated any field of value. The House of Atreides is kind of like stuck in mo classical modernity where they have what I call, you know, kind of a, a crypto normativity. Crypto normative means crypto, a hidden normativity, meaning there's a hidden code of value that, that no one acknowledges is there. They assume that value is real, but they but then they in theory say it can't be real. It must be made up. But let's just assume it's real and act as if it's real. I call those common sense sacred axioms of value. They work for modernity. They don't work anymore. Post-modernity ripped them apart. They got completely destroyed, right? And really they got destroyed already in modernity, but just the fact that they got destroyed became public in post-modernity. And we have a world devoid of actually commanding value. Because we think commanding value is pre-modern, traditional. So we've completely rejected commanding value in any, any real sense. And as I've shared with you a thousand times, you take a book like Sapiens, which Barack Obama endorses, and it says, no stories are real, no values are real, no difference between going to England and working for Amnesty International to save people and going right to, to not to England, going from England to Syria and working for Amnesty International to save people or going from England to Syria to slaughter people in a crusade 700 years earlier. There's no essential difference in terms of intrinsic value between those two. Values completely made up. But that's, that's the best-selling book in the mainstream of culture, endorsed by cultural figures all over the world in the mainstream as the best book they've read. That's their book. I mean, that's where we are. So what we need to do is we need to, and, and there's good reason why value got thrown out. And so what we need to do is we need to start from the beginning, receive all the wisdom that's out there, and then retell the story. But we can't do it sitting where I used to sit in Wolfson College at Oxford University in my little cubicle. It's not going to work. It's going to work here on one mountain. we got to be talking to each other here on one mountain. We got to be talking to each other at the mystery school. We have to be talking to each other at the board meeting. Right? We have to be talking to each other right in the Unique Self Institute. We have to be talking to each other as we artistically try and craft, right, right, a, a new volume. And we just finished crafting a volume, right, which which Clint Fuse worked up, worked on, and and Kirsten did a key piece in, and Paul and Carol did a key piece in, and then Elena came in and did a kind of a masterful kind of artistic reweave, right? And it's a book on the, you know, called Homemade, right? Relationships for the Future. We just put in 200,000 words. We just sent it to the publisher two days ago, right? So we're, right, you know, it's going to be the Dharma Recap. It's going to be Kirsten's, right? It's going to be, right, we're all, it, it's the Unique Self Institute. It's the Phenomenology of Eros, right? 15 volumes. It's the Outrageous Love Project, right? All of these, all of these, it's distinctions, all of these pieces, all of the research we do, Jacqueline, right? All of the pieces, right? It's all of the oral essay books that 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 Krista's, you know, launching and leading, right? And I could mention a thousand other names. And Jamie, the research you just send me, right, is going to be critical, right? And it's again, I pretend I said everybody's name. I'm. That's not the point now. The point now is just be with me. It's just like so we've created this this very very iconoclastic, but also idiosyncratic kind of system 
for a very, very, for the smallest amount of money we can, right? Elena tells me we're going to get a big influx of, um, of funds soon and be able to hire all the researchers we need. So Elena, I'm taking you seriously at that. I'm kind of, I keep going to the mailbox every day, just waiting for the new checks to come in. They haven't happened yet, but I have not. I'm not in any way giving up, but we're trying on a, because that would make a huge difference, but we're trying on essentially a shoestring budget. Don't be impatient. Okay, fair point, right? But we're trying on a shoestring budget to actually write this great library, right? And to have all the pieces fit together, right? And we're trying to do it not by, right? Not by, you know, creating this huge, heavy, you know, administrative institution, we're trying to do it in a way that doesn't meet any rules, but it's completely idiosyncratic, meaning it's completely unique. And we have our one mountain and we have our mystery school and we have the crossing, which we're going to run once now and, you know, you know, and unpack that. And we have the, the study groups, right? And we have the Dharma recaps and we have the oral essays and we have our incredible executive director, Krista, right? And as we have the, right, we have, right? And we have, you know, Dr. Kincaid is running you know, running the 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 outrageous love project and phenomenology of Eros and shots holding the crossing and right and again thirty other names, right? Each one of us, right? And I'm waiting for Benjamin to step in big time. He's going to blow Substack away and kind of build it, right? And that's whoever all the people are. But the point is, right? We're all stepping forward. We're all stepping in, right? And we're we've created this this thing which is actually what history always had. In some sense, we call ourselves the think tank but we're really a mystery school, but we're really a band of outrageous lovers, a band of outrageous friends. And we're trying to use the web to find each other around the world, create deep intimacies in the places that are appropriate and the way, the way that they should be in, in all of the imperfection. You know, there's a blaze of light in every word. It doesn't matter which I heard, the holy or the broken hallelujah. It's all imperfect, my friends. But it's actually, here's the crazy thing, the band of erotic mystics, it's working. That's really what I wanted to tell you. And right? it's working, right? Right, it's working. Right, it's working. Something is working. Something's going right. Something's happening. That's like a big deal. Something's happening. You can, you can feel it coming together. You can feel it, right, beginning to, right? And I just want to, you know, if you really get that, you can actually, you can tremble in joy. And it's not, it's far from done. It's far from done. We're at we're, we're we're and we're not in the beginning. I'd say we're at the we're at the end of the beginning, and just about at the beginning of the middle. Does that make sense, everybody? Right, right. We're at the end of the beginning. We're just about at the beginning of the middle, but it's happening. It's actually here's the crazy thing I want to tell you, right? And I'm I'm so happy we just have a bunch of us. It's a I mean not a bunch of us. I'm mean, meeting. It's a I just sensed it was a little more intimate crowd today, which is awesome. Right, which is, and, and I know I see all sorts of new people have joined. So if you're new, I apologize if it doesn't work, but it's just like it's working. It's working. You know, Becca just wrote something in the chat box. So, Becca, at a key moment where we need to do a key project, Becca came and sent in a $10,000 check just one day. And I'm not generally mentioning those things now, but I just happened to see her right there, like exactly at that right moment, at a key moment, in a key time. Right. And, and other people stepped up and said, I'm going to do that project. I'm going to step in and do that project and hold that piece, right? Whatever that piece was. Right? It, we literally are a unique self-symphony and we don't fit into any box other than like, oh my God, we're, we're fiercely humble. But by humble, I don't mean, oh, we're just going to try and do a couple of little things. No, that, that's not what we mean. Meaning we know she's moving through us. We're artists, we're artists, right? We're a group of artists and, and we're using the mind and the heart and the body to paint a tapestry of a great library, right? Onto, right, the canvas of history in response to the meta crisis. I mean, literally, you know, I, I watched Dune when I did this podcast with Aubrey Marcus yesterday on Dune. And I said to Abzik, there's no story of value here. There's no first principles and first values. The House of Atreides just assumes first principles and first values, but we never know what they are. So of course, it's modernity. They're never explicated. They get destroyed because they just assume first principles and first values, but they don't know how to articulate them. And then politics and power and, and, and bad spice journeys 
right? And, and, and genetic engineering, you know, and humans who have become artificial intelligence, mentats, this, you know, these strange symbiosis, they take the day because there's no value. There's no story of value that's compelling. That's an expression of the intrinsic structure of value in cosmos that can actually create coherence in this cosmic universe, right? So you've got this huge cosmos, but there's no coherence, right? And let's hold here. So, so th this is what we're about, okay? What we're about is, right, is, and I'm gonna say maybe one more sentence, and this is for Becca, right? Some of, or, or for, um, I just wrote something about the irrepressible worms, right? So there's these worms, right, in, um, in Dune. And the whole point of Dune is that you wanna, you wanna get desert power. So the whole move of Dune is, is can we, right? And desert power means we're the Fremen who live on Arrakis and we merge, right, with the desert. So it's this ecological goal, but it's bullshit, right? Because an ecological goal falls apart when your ecology is not rooted in an ecology of value. And so the Fremen become jihadist fanatics who wind up killing 62 billion people in the galaxy, if you follow the Dune story, and destroy 90 planets along the way. The Fremen don't work. The Fremen are a failure. And they're a failure because they absolutize a particular ecological understanding, right? They take strains from the ancient traditions, the pre-modern traditions. They're actually rooted in Zen Sunniism, and some combination of Zen and Sunni in the Dune trilogy, but there's no new story of value. The entire Dune trilogy is let's take different pieces of pre-modernity and weave them together in a kind of confused story with no intrinsic coherent vision of value. There's no moral vision. There's no vision of who the good person is. Completely unclear. The movies come, right? It, wow. So, so it's a big deal, right? It's a big deal. Right, right. The, the feminine snake eats people capriciously, has no moral center, the feminine snake. Right. There's an attempt to merge with the snake, which is which is the raw desert power, but you can't do it, you can't do that without value. If you do that without value, then the snake eats you up, like it did Paul's Atreides son, Leto II, who actually merges literally with the snake. And actually the Bene Gesserit. Right later in the series, the Bene Gesserit themselves attempt to actually merge and become the snake, but they do it without a code of value, without a field of value. That's why the Bene Gesserit actually destroy the House of Atreides for political reasons. Okay, end little Dune, little kind of illusion, end close. But d does it make sense, everyone? And thank you for just allowing this, just kind of we're like in this little fireside chat, just chatting together. I just wanted to like unpack for a second as I listened to Haley doing the beautiful Dharma recap, and I was just kind of opening my heart as Krista was, was chanting, because we open our heart again and again. And I, I wanted just to share with you, this is how the pieces fit together. In other words, you know, Elena's unpacking and then the summation, right? And then Krista's doing this, and then Jamie does this, and then Becca does that, and Benjamin does this, and Mark does this, and Dr. Kincaid does that, and Claire does that, and David does that, and Zohar's Right, we're kind of we're kind of deep in there, right? In other words, and we're right. In other words, that's what we're doing. And then Jeffrey right does this, and then Vano is doing that, and then Jasper is kind of stepping in and, and kind of right, right. In other words, and we come together and we literally each have an irreducibly unique note to play in the symphony. We gather in the ways that we gather, but with this insanely beautiful intention. Right. In other words, it's that time between worlds, time between stories. And out of all of this, right, this new story of value emerges. Now, I, I do admit that, you know, when Elena's prophecy is fulfilled, and I'm patient, right, and it will be fantastic, right, to hire researchers in each field, that's critically necessary. But still, we will remain the core. This is irreplaceable. And, and it's irreplaceable, not just because of what we do, but because of who we are. Does that make sense? It's who we are. It's not just what we do, right? It's who we are together. So it's, it's in other words, it's the links between us. Does everyone get that, Becca? Becca rocks. 
right? Right. It's the links between us. It's the subtle energy that moves between us. It's about how we right hold each other, right? Right. How we hold each other. Okay. It's like wow. Wow. Yeah. Cha. Cha, huh? Okay. So just 10 seconds just to make me feel better. Was that helpful? Was that helpful to anyone? Was it was, was if there were and, and if and if um if it wasn't helpful, say yes anyways, just so I'll, right? I just so I'll feel better. But I, I just thought it was just this intimate moment, this really beautiful intimate moment where we could just kind of share a little bit and just kind of right like that. Okay. So what I would like to do is, I know we're gonna do prayer, but I would like to do is just a little bit, okay. I'd like to actually, if we can, right? I want to actually bring everyone on. I'm going to just bring everyone on for a second. We're just, we're kind of stealing this moment here. We can just bring everyone on, Crystal. Let's bring everyone on. And I want to just take any, you know, any questions. Because right? I want to just, we're just kind of, we're still, it's just this moment, this time between worlds. And as I was listening to Haley, and I know we've got, I have, I have right here an entire thing I want to talk to you about today. We'll, we'll start the hero next week. But I just, I just thought there's this moment we could just, you know, find each other, right? And anyone just have a question? Right on anything I said, but a question that builds, right? A question that kind of builds, that helps, that opens, that right, right, that kind of takes us right some next step or wants to add some insight about how this is kind of working in your heart or body. So that's a great question, right? David asks a fantastic question. David says, "How do you know what to do in this ecosystem?" One thing to do is just to be present. That's huge, right? Just to be here and to hold the one mountain, for example, is a huge, gorgeous fantastic thing. I look every week for Cullen and Merritt. Where are they? They're there. And I, I say, oh, they're there. And I kind of relax. And I say, okay, let, let's hang out. So being present together, right? Being here together, I get to be, I said, where's Daryl? Okay, we're awesome. Where's Becca? Right? Lane, here he is, right? We're good, right? And, you know, Angel, right? Right? We're okay. We made it through. Okay, we're good, right? Right? So it's just, it's just fantastic just to be together, right? Tanya, welcome. Or Tana, Tana. Or Tana, is it Tana or Tana? Give us a, just pronounce it for us so we know how to pronounce it right. It's Tana. Tana, Tana it is. It was obviously the third one that I didn't say. Tana, Tana it is, welcome. Okay, Simona, right? So in other words, right, of course, Oriana. Without Oriana, we can't even begin, right, to move or do anything. Trish, right? So Ujis, right? So we we find ourselves, okay? And we see, we see Scott's great jacket, okay? So that's one thing that we do, okay? That's great. So showing up is a very, very, very big deal. And holding the center and being fully here and present is huge. That's one. Two is, then a person says, okay, is there a way that I wanna step in and contribute uniquely? Is there a kind of a unique contribution that I wanna make? And then, you know, a person can find me or find Krista, right? And then we can see, is there, right? Which is, which is a, a deep one-on-one -on -one conversation. Right. And and we don't we don't create kind of rent in, in most people that might not be the case, but some people there'll be a perfect place to step in. And there's multiple ways of stepping in. There's multiple ways of kind of right resourcing and actually creating next steps, which are hugely important. I mean, the only way the center's moved is through that. And so, David, that's a fantastic question. So the answer is find me, find Krista, right? And find, okay, what could be a fantastic way for me to step in? Right. And again, I'll be just kind of completely uh, maybe too honest, which is we've learned that unless a person really fits the job, unless it's a real match, right, then it's actually more, much more exhausting to manage it, right? And it doesn't work. So we're actually being, being very, very precise now, but there's, there's, you know, and it might be something like, wow, I want to step in and help, you know, keep track of something going on online. There might be something going on online that we want to keep track of in order to make a contribution, like, you know, whatever that is, right? Uh, there's, there, there's a thousand things where Krista can actually use some really, really, really important help, right? So find me, find Krista and say, I'd love to help. And Krista can say, wow, help here, which is gorgeous. That, that, is, that is, I mean, we are fundamentally a volunteer organization, right? We're fundamentally, and Lane, you're reading, you're awesome, man. That's fantastic, right? That's gorgeous, right? So, so. So that's, you know, there's, there's, a, there's at least 10 major operational places, 
right? Where, where, where there's like huge contributions a person can make, okay? Which is fantastic and gorgeous, right? So look for those, look for those, right? And so there's that kind of resourcing. There's of course, obviously financial resourcing. There's giving of time. There's participating in an event, helping staff an event and organizing before and after the event. There's a thousand things to do. There's, there's writing something which is unique of your own, but that actually fits into the great library in a real way. Right. So, for example, I'll just give you a, a, you know, a dumb example, but a good one I've been doing with Kathy Brownback, Holy of Holies, for about 12 years, right, since 2009. Right. And the last six years, we've been working together on a book, which is going to be her book on education and unique self, secondary education on unique self. Right. And because she's a, she's a she's been a key figure in the world of secondary education as the, um, you know, as the uh, dean at Exeter. And it's going to be a fantastic book. And Lori Galperin is working on a book on, who's one of the, the best clinicians in the country, on a book on unique self and, and essentially attachment theory. So there's, there's those kinds of contributions. It's a different kind of contribution, which is not more or less important than taking one field of operations with Christian and taking it over. Right. So there's many, many beautiful ways to step in. Now, the key to do it is, is the key to do it is, right, and everyone can get mad at me in the next second is, is you have to be willing to do stuff that that doesn't exactly match what you would naturally do. So I spend about 50% of my day doing things for the center that are not really in my kind of natural wheelhouse, right? Whether it has to do with budgets or funding or just details, right, Rob? Stuff that you don't want to be doing, right, brother? Right, so, so there's no way to do this and get an exact fit. The only way it works is I'm actually, I'm devoted to the larger vision and I stop looking at it as something that entertains me or that I kind of stop by because it enriches me, which is beautiful. If that works for you, that's fantastic. That's gorgeous. If you just want to be present and right, hold the space, that's gorgeous and fantastic and welcome and thank you, thank you, thank you. But if you want to go the next step, what you're doing, you're saying is, wow, I'm going to make this mine in a new way. So I'm not going to ask to do something which kind of fits, right? I'm going to say, what actually is of service? Right, right. So, so I know Shahati and Suzette hold our budget. Last thing they want to be doing, right? It's you know, you know. But I said to them, guys, make sure we know every dollar where it is, so we have integrity. So they do that, right? That's like, for example, that's an example, right? Just uh, not exactly what they would want to do, right? Shahati says to me, "Why am I doing this?" Right? <laughs> because, because I totally trust Shahati, and I know that her and Suzette are going to hold that really, really well. Right. And Jackson and I are moving papers around all the time in this very complex way, right? Where we're, we're photostatting things and copying them and putting them in the right file. And then, right. And then Ujus is stepping in, right. And it's, there's, there's a lot of things that happen, but you got to step in and be kind of like, okay, I'm stepping in. And I'm actually, I'm giving, I'm giving a radical gift. And there's, n make it yours. I mean, make the revolution yours because it can be and it should be. And it is. And it's also totally gorgeous to show up with full presence every week and make it yours that way. But it's like, I mean, let me let me say the kind of tender, hard sentence, right? Right. Sometimes people say to me, right, right, why why is this so urgent? Well, because it is, right? <laughs> As it is. And it's fully spacious. That's the paradox. And it's fully relaxed. And it's like, right? We're in play and we're in delight and we're in joy and we're in celebration. So that's actually completely true. I want to, that's the paradox. We're in full celebration. We have no idea what tomorrow actually brings. And I would do this no matter what, right? In other words, if I got $50 million tomorrow, I would do this to the last day of my life. I mean, every day, all day, no matter what. If I was offered, which I have been at different stages, large congregations, you know, Jewish or not Jewish, and I've gotten a few not Jewish offers in the last decade, right? Come take this like huge congregation in some major metropolitan city, and it's this fantastic job, which is a shitload of money. You got this huge congregation every week. I said no. And the reason I said no is because it's not interesting. It's not going to change the source code. I want to be hanging with us like in this crazy source code project, right? There were a lot of jobs open in Florence that da Vinci didn't take and Ficinio didn't take. So, so it's like madly exciting to be with Benjamin, right? And to kind of be with Ujus and to kind of be working on this. So mad invitation to step in it in any way that you feel you can step in, like 
step in. And so it's fully spacious. It's the most relaxed thing in the entire world, fully open and urgent. <laughs> All right. so, so which one is true, right? Which one is true? Well, I don't know. Ask Elena. I'm not responsible for this shit, right? Right. Do you get my point, right? In other words, right? They're both true. They're both beautifully true. It's both fully spacious, true self, nothing to do, no place to go. We're in the ground of being together, right? And it's also ecstatically urgent. It's becoming. And it's we're creating the future. And we actually have the sense, not incorrectly, that trillions of lives depend on what we do in this generation. That's just true. That's not drama. That's what Barbara and I both understood. That's not drama. That's not overstated. At least from the perspective of the human being, right? We are the link between the past and the future. And we live at a generation of exponential risk, exponential technology, which creates existential risk in a way that we never have in history. That's true. That's true. And the potential death of our humanity or humanity is a very, very real and even in the natural courts of events where we would probably get, not according to kind of random people, but according to the people who spend the best time doing the best analysis of the situations. Now, they became doomers. People like Joanna Macy, Barbara's good friend, Elena, became a doomer. Michael Dowd wrote, thank God for evolution. He did all the study, he became a doomer. They just said, actually, Gaffney, you're naive. There's no move to make. It's over. That's not true. Right? There's a thousand moves to make, and we're not the only people making moves. She's making moves with us. Right? Right? The, the very same energy that moved evolution at the moment of the Big Bang moves through us, and evolving the story changes everything. And Dune is exactly an expression of what happens when you don't evolve the story. Right? That's exactly right. And it is in part a cautionary tale, right, Dune. But he thought it was a cautionary tale in response to jihad and messianism. It's actually a cautionary tale about the house of Atreides not explicating a field of value, just assuming value is real and taking it for granted. And actually that doesn't work. Bracket, okay? So, wow. Any any other, let's see what other questions we have here. What other questions? I see Chris, Ted's question. What's the simplest way to invite people to the new story of value? Well, the, the simplest way to invite them is to actually come be with us, right? Or read this book or read Unique Self, right? I mean, start with actually a reading. Start with a reading. I would start with Return to Eros or Unique Self. I would do those before First Principles and First Values. First Principles and First Values, just between us, it's actually a very high level primer. It's written in very short term sentences that assume a lot. And so actually it's like, so lots of people are reading it now. I mean, the first few hundred people are loving it, but they're very high level readers. It's not unpacked. It's written as kind of terse, almost in code. They're almost sutras, this book, but, but it's great. You know, Unique Self is more unpacked. Return to Eros is more unpacked, right? Um, Lena, the book we just finished, I think is much more unpacked, right? Right, Future of Relationships, much more unpacked. Universal Love Story books are much more unpacked. By the way, just a little note, Sally Kempton used to love a book, which I, you know, which Shahati and I put together a long time ago called Loving Your Way to Enlightenment, which is poorly edited, badly put together, right? We did it like quickly, betwixt and between. And yet it's kind of this great opening, right? It's like, I, I would like, uh, Sally, I love that book. It's just, it's this thing we did in 2014, which is just kind of a throwing together of a bunch of Dharma talks. But it's actually not a bad way in, right? For some people. For other people, the book Self, it's a short, I don't have it on the table here. It's a short volume called Self, Two Models of Integral Evolutionary Mysticism. It's a great short first book. So, but in any case, that, that, those are, I would, I, the first, the way in is to be with us and to read both of those together, right? Any other kind of short questions I can do here? What am I missing here? Okay. It's fantastic. Terry, how do I know if it's real to or just Terry, Terry, Terry's question? How do I know if it's real, true, or just my programming? But I'm not sure what he was referring to. Terry, you want to help us with that? Yeah, let me. I'm just saying. How do I how do I trust my anthro ontological knowing that when I sense something as a real and true value, that it's really so, 
and uh, you know, not just something that I'm trying to do because my dad loved me when I got an A. Well, there, there. That's what I like about you, Terry. Just a little minor question. Let's just throw in, <laughs> you know, along the way, right before prayer. And and how's that? And how's the weather? Yeah. <laughs> right. So Terry has some. I, I'm just going to note the goodness of the question, which is, how can I distinguish? It's a great question between that which is actually the good, the true, and the beautiful. Right. All right. How can I distinguish between value that lives in me? Right. And dad's programming. Right. It's a great question. That's a great question. And actually, there's what we call the seven steps of the anthropological method, which actually is in this book. It's in First Principles and First Vows, which I know most people haven't gotten yet. It's not on Amazon yet, although you can already order it on Amplify, but it'll be on Amazon by the beginning of April. But there's a little section called the seven steps of the anthropological method, which answers that question. Right. Right. In other words, but, you know, in one word, Terry, you got this for like one sentence, no punctuation, one sentence, no punctuation. If you have a value, so not just your value, but all your neighbors have some version of it Two, not just your neighbors, but your neighbors around the world. Right. Cross cultural three cross temporal, not just your neighbors around the world, but your neighbors throughout time. Right. Right. That's three, four right? Your neighbors who are the most subtle and speculative minds who have done the deepest work of clarification. So if you have a cross space in time, right? The most subtle and speculative minds who have done the deepest work of clarification. Now, if all those people agree that's a value and you feel it deep inside yourself, now you're you're on the way, right? In other words, the same way, and let me just answer one more part of the question, the same way we know things in physics, Right now, not exactly the same, but we do experimentation. We're always experimenting in the interior sciences, just like we are in the exterior sciences. And just like in the exterior sciences, there are peer reviewed journals, as there should be. Right. There's actually a community of the adequate in the interior sciences who live right across time and space and all over. Right. That actually we can actually bring together to actually get a kind of sense of the 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 validated insights at the leading edge of mind and heart and body across space and time. That that will begin to take you someplace, right? So it's not just, what do I feel? It's one one of the deep mistakes of the new age is how do I feel in this seminar at this time in this place? And we actually cut ourselves off from history, right? Both future history and past history. So I've got to be able to locate myself on the larger stream of time. And anthropology is not just a personal reflection, it's a much broader reflection, right? So that's that's a big deal. Now, you can't do that all yourself on everything. So then the question is, the next question is, because how do we access that? So what we're trying to do in the first principles and first values is to actually identify 18 first principles and first values that match that description. And then, Elaine, I'll be looking for that, that check in the mail that arrives from, you know, God knows whoever, whenever, um, you know what I mean? And I will be patient about it. But what we need to do is write actually a major piece of work on each of the 18 first principles and first values, right? In other words, and it's each one of those. So if anyone wants to know how I'd spend that $44 million, right, in one version of it, right? And that's each of those is its own body of work. And each of those you have to check across the great religions. Like it gets crazy cool now, Rob. This this is the coolest thing we said all day. You got to check it across the great religions and you got to check it across the sciences. Right. And that interesting. Then you got to check it across the literature. Right. And what you actually do is you actually bring together, right, a swath of literature, a swath of the sciences, and a swath of the great religions on each of the first principles and first values. Isn't that interesting? Okay. So I'm doing that anyways. But okay, if if you want to know, um, and maybe Elaine is going to send me some more kava drops, right? But now that's hard to do. Right. That's where a little bit of the whirlwind comes. I'm always trying to track across literatures and across the sciences and across the the great traditions and across actually different schools of psychology. Those are the major four with some anthropology thrown in for fun. I'm trying to track all 18 of those and trying to check them, check them, deepen them, deepen them, deepen them, clarify them, clarify them, clarify them. That's crazy, but it's doable. It's actually not hard. In other words, here's a crazy sentence. Right. A decade ago, I wouldn't have known to do that. How many people get what I mean by that? I'm sure a bunch do. 
meaning it took a decade to realize what to do. And until we were able to identify the 18 and then to realize how to research them, right? And the clarification on how to research is actually quite interesting and quite beautiful. And, and we all impact it and influence it, right? Right, it's like, wow, it's like, wow, right? And so each of us brings something unique to the table. And so for example, Howard Bloom, you know, our NASA friend, right? He brings a very specific thing to the table, right? Right, but, and it, but without it, can't do it because he understands something about a very particular set of things that are his expertise that are actually critical to the conversation. Let me just see, is there one more question? Hi, Mark, hi. Hi, Uchis, take it away. Yes. There should be something before first principles and first values and where love and consciousness stands in first principles and first values. They are not more in first order than in second order. So, so that's a good question. So they are. In other words, eros is love. Eros means love, right? Eros is love, brother. Where'd you go, Ujis? We just lost you. It was just there. He's back. Okay, right? Eros is love. So eros is primary first principle, right? So if you look here, right? So in other words, there's an entire critical first principle, right, on eros. It's number two, right? Eros is love. That's what eros is. Right, so, so that, that is actually the equation for what love means. Eros is the best word for love. So there's an entire Eros, entire principle, right? And then in terms of consciousness, right, the word for consciousness, consciousness means many things, but one part of consciousness is what we call eternity. But by eternity, we don't mean lots of time. We mean the consciousness that lives beneath time, right? And that's on the first order first principle is what's called temporality and eternity. But what you're noticing where it says eternity, there's eternity, that's over here. That's a page, what page is it? What page is it? Page 168. And it's the second of the first order principles on page 168. It's number two. Okay. So that's where that appears. It's also consciousness is also, right? The, the sixth one, which is interior and exterior which starts with consciousness consciousness and matter. So it's those, those are the two major ones, but it's also related to value. But I just want to notice something here, Ujis, because you're pointing something out, which is important. What you're noticing is I'm staying away with intention from languages like love and consciousness, right? So you're correct about that. You're not, you're not, you're not wrong that you're like, you're noticing something important because you're obviously wise and, and you're Ujis. So the word consciousness and love are so overused and they've literally ceased meaning anything. They're used in a thousand different ways by a thousand different people and they simply don't mean anything anymore, right? They're, they're just, they're used badly. They're used inappropriately, right? And, they're, and they've become, they've kind of been hijacked either by, by new age fundamentalism or by pre-modern fundamentalism and they, they've ceased to impact. Right. So 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 we all worship at the altar of love, but what it means is lost its meaning. It's grown flaccid. So I've stayed away and tried to both deepen thought and also create a new field of language. Right. So, for example, a field of value. Right. Is that the way we want to talk about it? That's interesting. We talk about eros, not love for lots of good reasons. Right. In other words, so we've tried to do is actually lay down both new structures, evolving structures of thought, but also a new field of language, right? Which I think is critical. So it's it's kind of like, just like the word God, right? I love the word God and I love God, right? Just to be clear, right? In other words, I love the word God and I love God, right? And, right? And we haven't placed the word God at the center because it's so confusing. What do you mean when you say God, right? Do you mean the punishing God? Right. Whom, you know, when I ran into the bathroom and my mother was mad at me and she banged at the door and said, God's going to find you in there. Is it that God we're talking about? Right. Which God are we talking about? Are we talking about the God that you learned? OK, you were like 15 year old guy and you were self pleasuring. Right. And you read, oh, God's going to punish you for that. Is it that God? Like, which God are we talking about? Right. So it gets a little confusing. And that's why we say the God you don't believe in doesn't exist. We're trying to shatter something and we're trying to create a universal grammar of value. 
And so bless all the holy people who are talking about consciousness and love. They should do that. And that's great. But we actually need to create new language, right? We need to create new language. So even the word that Barbara didn't create, but she spent her life as the storyteller of, right? And as I always say, Barbara was not the greatest theorist of conscious evolution, although she had an excellent mind, an excellent, sharp, inquisitive, creative, beautiful mind. But her greatness was, she was, the, she was actually the greatest storyteller of conscious evolution, right? Which is a much bigger accomplishment. And so she took that word that had been around, but narrowly, few people were using it, conscious evolution. And she spent her life telling the story of that word and did it beautifully. And what's great about the word conscious evolution is it's surprising because evolution is supposed to be unconscious, supposed to be by chance. And now we're using conscious. And what does that mean? And, and whether she got it exactly right or wrong is a different conversation. We wrote about that, Elena, right? Kirsten, in this new book, we tried to up-level conscious evolution, but it's a new term. It's a new term. And that new term is actually very powerful. And without that new term, Ariana, we met through Barbara, without that new term, right? Actually, it wouldn't have impacted. So creating a new field of language is a big deal, okay? And maybe I'll say one, one last thing, and then we'll, uh, well, we, we can, we can, if there's a, if there's a, right, right. So instead of consciousness, Joycey, instead of consciousness, we use value, field of value, for example, not values, not what, not value, 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 value itself. We use value. We use eros. And now we're using a new term that we developed, right, right, when you, when, when you were um, on vacation in Bali, Right, right. Joyce was on a little Bali vacation, which just got back and we're like, I'm just teasing you. And we're just delighted to see you. But while you were in Bali, we started using a new term that you're not familiar with, which we're just on that called Eros value as one word. It's just like we talk about love intelligence and love beauty and love desire as one word. So we've created a new term, which I think is going to be very helpful called Eros value as one word, capital E, capital V, Eros value. Right. It's a new term, which is consciousness. It's just consciousness. It's actually, it's, it's referring, but actually when you think about consciousness, people think about awareness, right? Awareness, but awareness is boring. I mean, just everyone do a little check, anthropological check, right? Say the word awareness and see how it makes you feel. Awareness, right? <laughs> awareness is boring, right? Ray, I'd like to rest in awareness my whole life. Really give me some pancakes with Anjamima syrup and wake me the fuck up, Right? Right, awareness, really, right? I mean, but but it's a big deal. It's like really, oh, let's 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 get the whole world on board for awareness. Kill me, slay me. I want to die, right? So awareness is a very limited word. It only it only covers one dimension of consciousness, right? So we need to get no, no. It's eros value, is what consciousness is, right? And by the way, by the way, right the <laughs> You know, the folks in early Cosmer Shaivism who got a lot of shit wrong, by the way, but one of the things they got right was they talked about Sat, Chit, Ananda. And Sat, right, this is Ujjas, this is for you. Sat is being, Chit is consciousness, and Ananda is really Eros value, right? Actually, although they wouldn't have said it that way, but Ananda, they talk about bliss, pleasure, but actually value and pleasure are deeply related. Pleasure is always the pleasure of a value. Right, always. Right, pseudo eros is a fake value. Right, so cha. Right, so it's a universal grammar of eros value. And it's laying down a field, and what we do here is in one mountain. Right, truly, last sentence is this is where we clarify all this. Right, and as we come together and we talk, but it's not about oh, let me talk at you and give a presentation. It's not that. It's like okay, this is what we're thinking about in the Dharma. Let's talk about it. Right. And then in the conversation, as we're preparing during the week, and then as you know, as we play with it, as Elena rewrites it, as it gets onto the week, right? As we right, then and then and then, and then it goes to Kirsten. We might put it into a book and then it might get clarified there or clarified there. So we're actually as a community, we're David J. Templing, our pseudo-anonymous author, right? And we're we're actually creating that's but that's actually the way it's always happened. That's what the Marcello, Marcello Ficino's. Neoplatonic Academy in Florence was exactly this. And the Eleusian, you know, mystery school in Greece was actually similar to this. And there were mysteries, right? In other words, we 
and we're doing it online and we're using WhatsApp and we're using, right, you know, this, these, right, we're, it's a new world. But that, that's what we are. We're a band of outrageous lovers, right? Madly concerned with the meta crisis in full celebration of life, fully urgent, right? Writing this great library together and then downloading into culture, an impossible project, which no one should undertake. And yet here we are and what an insane joy. So, so just like, thank you everyone for it. Just, I just, and, and again, I apologize if this is not what you signed up for today, but I just kind of had this sense in my body as I was listening to Christina Amelon just unpack the different things that we were we were doing of like, let's just, this is like a perfect moment just to kind of, what are we doing? How all these things fit together, right? They, and they're, they all do, they all, they're all actually part of a coherent, right? Full vision, wildly imperfect. And I guess as we, we we close, right, right, as we close, I would just say, in anything that you think that I did wrong, please just assume that you're right. And and I I really truly I mean this completely sincerely, and I apologize in advance. Right, so I'm sure I get a million things wrong, and I can't keep up with everything. And, and you know, and, and there might be a million reasons where we're we do something that's off in some way. So anything you think I did wrong, I would just take it as a given that you're right. Like total. And I I literally, but for like bottom of my heart, like forgive me and I apologize. And I am 1000 percent an imperfect vessel for the light. Right. That's always what we are. And so, like my deep, my deep, deep heartfelt apology, you know, sincerely from the bottom of my heart, you know, in advance and but anything back and anything present and anything and anything forward, right? Okay. Shaw, Shaw.